Good morning and thank you very much for uh, being here with us uh, on today. Uh, my name is Starsky Wilson. I'm uh, blessed and pleased to serve uh, as co-chair of the Ferguson Commission uh, along with my partner uh, and friend Rich McClure. Uh, we are um, excited to have today uh, with us, of course, uh, you'll see remarks uh, from, you'll receive remarks from uh, our co-chairs of our Citizen Law Enforcement Relations Working Group uh, of the Commission, um, uh, both Brittany Packnett uh, and Commissioner Dan Isom. Uh, also with us on today, of course, my co-chair uh, and president members of, uh, a member of the Commission uh, and this working group, uh, Sergeant Kevin Albrand of the St. Louis uh, Police Department, uh, also a president of the Missouri Fraternal Order of Police, uh, Chief Sam Dotson of the Metropolitan Police Department for the City of St. Louis, uh, Chief Steve Rungi from uh, the Charlock Police Department, uh, Barb O'Connor uh, from St. Louis Police Wives Association, and Amy Stark also from the Police Wives Association. Uh, we will uh, share comments really in that order. Uh, I'll begin um, as followed by uh, Rich, uh, and then uh, remarks from our co-chairs um, will frame out uh, the rest of our time together. Uh, most significantly, we want to note um, uh, actions uh, of this week uh, of the uh, commission uh, from our previous meeting uh, and some responses that we are already hearing uh, in the community. Uh, recent cases of police violence and communal responses that we have seen from our community and in others across the nation, even within the last uh, 24 hours, have really raised the stakes uh, and, quite frankly, uh, the bar for police training and accountability. Uh, for this um, reason and with this in mind, I'm really grateful uh, for the work of Commissioners Isom and Packnett uh, leading our Citizen Law Enforcement Working Group uh, and the entire commission that came together and on this past Monday uh, put together a call to action for the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission of the State of Missouri, uh, the Director of Public Safety, uh, newly uh, installed into his office, and Governor Nixon. Uh, to enact policy to increase the quality and quantity of police preparation and wellness. Uh, today we welcome these voluntary commitments of local police departments and really quite frankly we call on all police departments throughout uh, the St. Louis region to meet these standards uh, for officer wellness uh, for uh, training in the area of use of force and training for anti-bias policing uh, as well. And so we here, we're here today really to reinforce that call to action uh, and invite others to act uh, while that process is moving. Uh, we now hear from our co-chair, Rich McCool. This training model is a result of input from law enforcement officers, from community members and activists, members of the Citizen Law Enforcement uh, Working Group. Our communities will be safer if our police have the support and training to understand the people they serve, to respond to circumstances in ways that protect everyone, and to protect officers' physical and mental well-being. We are so appreciative of those who have and who we believe now will stand with us in agreement that increased tactical, anti-bias, and officer wellness training is a key step toward a shared goal of enabling law enforcement agencies to serve and protect all citizens based on principles of trust and mutual respect and transparency and cultural competence and justice. And this model, we believe, is a prime example of the work we can do as a community when we're able to come together, all of us, from very different interests and come to the table and work through these challenges. We're appreciative of the co-chairs of the Citizen Law Enforcement Working Group. And first, we'd like to call on Commissioner Brittany Packnett uh, for comments, and then Commissioner Dan Isom for comments as co-chairs. Brittany. Thank you so much to the commission co-chairs. Um, this training model is just the beginning. It only addresses three of the nine focus areas currently identified by our working group um, and is not yet comprehensive. As we've seen from recent events in Ferguson, Baltimore, and nationwide, injustice is still present in daily life. Our work is not done until unarmed bodies cease to fall. We have much, much more to explore, including issues of accountability and oversight before we are truly making progress toward justice and equity for all in our region. We urge local law enforcement agencies to implement these new baseline training models with expediency and the urgency this moment calls for but there is still greater work ahead. Commissioner Isom. 
So I want to thank everyone for their input on these uh, training standards um, because it's been proven that um, good tactics and training in tactics will reduce incidents of use of force. They will keep officers and citizens safe. In the area of tactical training, we recommended um, eight hours every year for a total of 24 hours in a three-year period. Uh, that would focus on uh, real-life scenarios where officers will be able to use their skills in determining what type of use of force tools that they will, will use and also what type of force they will have to use. It's also understood that anti-bias training will provide understanding and appreciation for d diversity, not just in terms of race, but also age, gender, sexual orientation, and sexual identification that will help officers uh, view threats through a different lens. It also off offers the opportunity uh, for communication to be a vehicle for controlling individuals. And so in anti-bias training, we will try to focus on those areas. Um, finally, the area of wellness. Uh, we recognize that the officer's job is, is very difficult, uh, that there are many stressors that they have to deal with on a regular basis. And we know that uh, performance can be affected by these areas. And so we have to pay attention to both the mental and physical health of officers. And in turn, we will receive better performance and better protection and service for our community. So we are calling for police departments to consider these uh, training standards, eight hours in tactical training, eight hours in anti-bias training, and eight hours in wellness training um, for each year and then for 24, 24 hours um, for each of those areas. Uh, we believe that this will provide better protection and service for our community and better protection and service for citizens and officers alike. Thank you. So at this time, we'd be prepared to take any questions, and I'll moderate and parcel them out uh, as appropriate. Any questions? There are yes, so sir. many police departments in our area of varying sizes. Is there some concern or provision in here for how to keep that training uh, consistent or at a, at a high level between all those departments? Because some of them obviously are quite, quite small. Yeah. Let me ask Commissioner Isom, who's uh, talked to some of those departments as well as to the folks that do the training, to respond to that. Yeah. Well, certainly um, the details of how the training is going to be accomplished will have to be worked out, of course, between uh, post, individual police departments, and also police departments collectively. Um, but some of the police chiefs that I've talked about have expressed the, uh, the idea of trying to share the responsibility of this training. Um, so smaller police departments uh, banding together and um, having one trainer uh, train multiple people. Um, there is also a lot of training that is done through the St. Louis uh, County Police Academy and um, police departments have the opportunity to go to that training academy and receive some of this training as well. How about the funding? Who would pay for this? Well, we recognize, and that, that is a, a, a significant issue, we recognize that this is uh, a larger demand on resources, staffing, and money. Um, but we do believe that it's important that we we address these areas. Um, the wellness of officers, um, extremely important. Uh, giving them the tactical skills to keep them safe and citizens safe. And also having a, a better understanding of their community. And so um, there is the recognition from the commission that it will cost more money, it will take more resources, um, but we hope that uh, both the community, the citizens, and, and everyone involved will provide the support uh, for these police departments so they can accomplish it, this. They can't accomplish it on their own, so they're going to need the support of the community um, to help with the resources and funding to get it done. Is it something you consider going to the legislature, making it statewide? Uh, I might just uh, insert here a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to acknowledge that um, several police departments, particularly larger ones, the city of St. Louis is the prime example, uh, have already implemented voluntarily many of these, um, many of these practices and increased training uh, and done that voluntarily and have begun to move 
forward aggressively. And so we do need to acknowledge that, um, that several departments have recognized that and, and Chief Dodson is here, um, uh, I think, to represent the fact that the city, uh, in fact, has done that. Secondly, uh, in our view, from a commission's perspective, there is really, this is one of the top priorities. And so resources should be allocated wherever they come from to train and, pro and provide officer wellness um, uh, curriculum in a way that does protect and serve all of our citizens. And so uh, departments will have to look carefully. The legislature could look at the question of post-funding uh, in, in next year's budget, but for the moment, we believe this is so important that folks should make this a priority. How do you make it so that it's not just voluntary, though? Funding aside, if there's no requirement to do it? Yeah, so there, there are two components here. Uh, what we're amplifying today is this call for voluntary engagement. But on Monday at the commission meeting, the commission officially acted uh, to call on the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission, which has oversight uh, for all officer training throughout the state to make this, um, uh, to make this a requirement, to officially make this policy uh, for communities of our size, for counties, uh, for class one uh, uh, counties, which would include uh, St. Louis uh, County, St. Louis City as well. And so, uh, so that would make it uh, a requirement. Uh, this is also an area where, uh, to the previous question that Chris asked, uh, as you think about uh, where's the capacity to, to monitor, provide oversight for this kind of training, that would be a state level issue that, that would need to be considered. But quite frankly, this is a priority issue for uh, police departments. It's a priority from the community. The community told us on December 1st, uh, as they ranked uh, those uh, issues in the executive order, that by 68% of them, this is the most important thing. This most important thing to the community, it must be the most important thing to the respective police departments and those who provide oversight for our police. So we're asking people uh, in their budgeting to prioritize uh, this particular request for training. And the most important for post, though, to get what you're wanting to make this permanent? I'm sorry? Is it most important for the post commission, though, to act on this? Are they making it a priority to put it in place as a requirement? There's new leadership at post, uh, where well, there's new leadership uh, at the Department of Public Safety. A uh, former commissioner has uh, taken, that, uh, taken that job. Uh, so we recognize that they're going to be uh, making some assessment uh, of their priorities in the coming weeks. Uh, we have communicated uh, what these uh, standards are directly to the governor's office, where the director of public safety uh, reports. Uh, we expect and anticipate. Uh, we've received some, um, some suggestions that there would be support here. Uh, we expect and anticipate that this could be an early priority uh, as that administration gets underway. Uh, so we look forward to hearing uh, that as well. But that's where the call is. The Better Together police reports reveal this sort of Chinese menu of police agencies just in St. Louis County. So it seems to me what you may be adding is another bar on this Chinese menu where some use it and some don't. Uh, is there any intention to translate this into legislation so that the state has a, a body over police agencies the way it has over individual officers and chiefs? Well, uh, let me jump in and then uh, Starsky or Dan or, or any others can, can add. Uh, first of all, the Police Officer Standing Standard Training Board has this authority now. They can enact a rule and adopt these standards, and that is our call for them to do. So legislation is not necessary to increase the number of hours for in-service training. Legislation would be necessary to increase the base number of hours of training for an officer to receive certification, which is 600 hours. Um, but our call is specifically for in-service training, and I would add, that uh, the major departments in St. Louis, particularly the city and the county, already do well beyond the 600 hour uh, requirement. But legislation's not required. We believe a rule uh, is the appropriate approach. Mm. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, it was along the same line as, as some of the other questions, but I was going to ask, of course, who will do the overseeing to ensure that the standards are met and the guidelines are met. But beyond that, um, what in community involvement do you intend to have? Because Will there be a person in these various, because there's so many municipalities that can be active in the committee to, you know, kind of follow through, report to churches, let people know that yes, they're really doing this, they are following through, I've seen the reports, I've gone to the meetings, and I know that this is happening, because there has to be some assurance that gets back to the community that you guys are really doing what it is that you say you're doing, aside from, like you say, mandating it, and making it legislation, how will that, how will you encompass the community right. into the process? Right. <laughs> so I'll say just a couple of things, and maybe uh, Chief Isom or uh, Commissioner uh, Pacnet want to speak to this more. Uh, but there are still areas to be um, 
to be noted in the work group's work, uh, specifically these areas of police accountability and oversight. Uh, and so these are things that are structural, that happen at local levels, um, that the working group is still assessing. Uh, and I think some of this would fall into those categories. Uh, this matter of community-oriented policing continues to be a part of the conversation as well. So those two things come together, as uh, Commissioner Packnett noted, this is a beginning, this is one component uh, as it relates to training that's been identified by the community. Those are accountability and oversight matters that are still working uh, through the working group and, uh, and those things I would imagine would be taken up there. And more to say. You know, I, I think there's still work to be done in terms of reaching out to more police departments and police officials um, to get them to voluntarily um, address some of these issues. And, and I will say many of them are. Um, this is an issue of how much more attention we ought to give, give to these areas. Um, in terms of oversight um, that would be mandated, it would come from post. And so that would be the, the most effective way of ensuring that uh, these standards are abided by. I will just add that I think that idea is sound to ensure um, that there is continued community input and community liaising to ensure that um, the messages that are, are being sent to the community are relevant and timely. Um, we did do some of this work and explore that issue in the President's uh, Policing Task Force, and we are using that report in particular to inform some of the work that we do. And so I appreciate that question to ensure that we make sure that that's in there. Um, and I will say what I said on Monday night, that the best way to make sure that that happens is for the community to continue to engage with our working group in particular. Um, and we meet on the off Mondays of the full commission meeting. So we will be at the University of Missouri St. Louis on, on next Monday. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? How can, and I'm looking for, I guess, Chief, one of the chiefs to answer this. As an officer on the street, does this training really kick in? I mean, will it prevent some of the things that have happened, especially with the recent incidents involving those who are battling with mental illness? So the first question is, I don't think we have an option not to do it. So I think you're asking a little bit of a predictive question to say, will it have an impact in every case? I think we have to start at the baseline that any training and any education that we can do does put the police officers in a more uh, advantageous position, does put the community in a more advantageous position. So while there is no crystal ball, we have already started with things like de-escalation training and over 300 officers in the Metropolitan Police Department have gone through this tactical training, this de-escalation training. We've started our implicit bias training. A more educated workforce, no matter whether it's police, a reporter, is a better workforce and that's where we're moving. Our goal is, is to make those interactions that happen in the community safer for everyone involved, and I think that's what we'll achieve by doing this. The stakes are too high for us not to do anything. What about, as, is the new challenge or more recent challenge of dealing with the mentally ill because there's less state and federal resources for them? I, I've said it many times that law enforcement has become the face of government in many communities and many neighborhoods with cutbacks in mental health programs, basic health services. 911 has become a primary service provider. So that we train our officers in crisis intervention to help identify mental health issues. But again, they're police officers and not clinical practitioners. We do a great job of training them, can always do more, but I think the rest of the community, law enforcement is a community endeavor. It's not just the police. It's the community, it's the commission, it's every church, it's every community group coming together. We have to work on it as, as a holistic problem and not just the symptoms of it. Let, let, let me just ask uh, before we move on, uh, Commissioner uh, Kevin Albrand, uh, head, President of the State Fraternal Order of Police, to also perhaps comment on this question. Well, I agree with, with the chief on that, but I just wanted to make one comment about uh, cost. Uh, now, particularly in the area of officer wellness, uh, the FOP has been working for months with uh, the St. Louis Police Wives Organization to uh, come up with some wellness training. And we have resources that we can draw from across the country. And the Fraternal Order of Police will be offering uh, this training free of charge to uh, any officer in Missouri. So uh, that's going to take a little bit of the sting out of uh, some of the funding uh, uh, methods. How are you going to be measuring what you've already put in place? How are you going to be measuring its effectiveness? Well, and what we're looking at is there's a variety of ways. Our encounters, our internal affairs complaints, um, 
really customer satisfaction, how we interact with people in the neighborhood. Because again, bottom line, we provide that service into a neighborhood. While I know you're looking for, for a tangible, um, it, it's a human enterprise. And so we look at IED complaints, we look at the number of complaints that we get from neighborhoods, how we address. But I think, again, it, it's putting the training in the hands of the officers, giving them the experience. And so again, we've already started a lot of the suggestions and we'll continue to follow through, not just through the post cycle, but ongoing. And, and Kevin talked about the, the wellness piece of it. I had the opportunity to hear a nationally renowned speaker talking about police officer wellness, just to give you an example. Last year, um, my numbers will be rounded a little bit. Last year, there were about 54 officers that were killed by suspects with guns. There were over 400 police officers or former police officers that took their own lives with guns. So we have to make sure we get into that mental health piece and provide our, our officers and our former officers with that. That's one way to measure it. Do we see a decrease in confrontations in the community? Do we see a decrease in police officer suicides? Again, every metric is going to be a little bit different, but those are things that we can look at. Is there any mechanism for if you have an officer who's in that situation, the trauma is getting to him, the stress is getting to him, there's a way to get him off the streets and at least until he's over there? And that's a great question. And the answer is yes. Major metropolitan police departments have what they call early warning systems which look at a variety of things. It will look at internal affairs complaints. It will look at resisting situations. It will look at attendance. It will look at a variety of factors. And there are, are metrics that you can gauge. And we do create interventions based on those metrics. So major metropolitan police departments do have early warning systems. Anything in here to make that more widespread? I, I think you have, I, I don't understand if the question as it applies to the city, I guess. That's well, this is for the commission. Okay. Yeah. Anything in these recommendations that will, you know, if the met major metropolitan so a couple of things, um, and this is one of the questions came up the other night, so a couple of clarifying points here. Uh, first, this is about training. Uh, it's, um, so the recommendations and the post commission have responsibility for officer training and the standards on officer training. Uh, so the wellness piece would be as far as training for wellness, recognizing these signs, how to care for oneself, uh, post-trauma growth and the like. Um, the second is that this is uh, not just by police department, this is by uh, metropolitan area. So this is county by county standard. So county, so this um, uh, recommendation would apply to all police departments that are in St. Louis County, or apply to all police departments that are in St. Louis City. Uh, so that kind of uh, grid, if you would, the Chinese grid, uh, it would make application throughout the entire county. Uh, but we need to note that this is about training, post has responsibility for for training uh, standards, uh, and so there's some other kind of intervention elements of what you're talking about that that would not apply to, uh, that those are still things that need to be taken up in other policy and oversight. Since Ferguson, we've had strong cities, and now the Promise Zone and my brother's keeper all bringing supposedly federal funding. It's always kind of vaguely stated, like suddenly we have, or more eligible somehow, for grants we were already eligible for. Do you guys have someone that's chasing down that money, any of those piles of alleged money? Um, speaking as a funder, I, I really uh, greatly appreciate your question <laughs> and the, the note of nuance that is there. Um, so yes, most of these uh, pools are um, provision of technical assistance from the federal government uh, and um, additional priority uh, for applications that come from the St. Louis metropolitan area uh, for pools of federal support. Uh, we have been in a very close uh, conversation with uh, local entities that are engaging here, uh, whether it's anyone from the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership uh, to, um, to folks who are working on the uh, other aspects of the Promise Zone application. Uh, as we think about uh, the ongoing responsibility for monitoring, implementation, and evaluation against our recommendation, uh, that's where we're really trying to uh, be, give attention to the intersections uh, for these funding opportunities. So do we have people dedicated to kind of bird dogging that specifically? No, but we are working with a nice group of partners uh, who are helping us to identify where there may be opportunities around specific recommendations uh, or things that are coming out of work groups and how we may leverage and connect them to networks in the community, anchor organizations who are already working in this space to be able to leverage for the entire region. Any idea of the cost for this, like say for um, I, I want to add just a quick point there, and then we'll see if, if Dan or others want to want to comment on the on the cost question. Although I would observe just by by way of preamble to that, that with the local academies, I, as we understand it, some of this coursework curriculum exists, 
uh, so it would need to be leveraged and, and then made available to additional officers. Um, the, uh, Starsky and I met with the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development privately um, just a day or so ago when he was here uh, to respond to your question, Chris, to talking about promise zones. Uh, and we talked about the Resilient Cities program, and we talked about uh, the, the grant possibilities that come as a result of the Promise Zone. So, but this is one where we partner with the organizations that actually apply for and administer those grants and then leverage them to, as Starsky said, adapt, uh, adopt to um, the, after we've adopted our recommendations, then adapt to them and, and implementing them. One other point on, on uh, mental illness training, if you look in the detail in the packet, uh, the issues on use of force and de-escalation and tactical training and recognizing what happens in an individual situation is part of that training process. Uh, the crisis intervention training that is now available in the state of Missouri and offered through the academies is really critical uh, for officers to have to be able to recognize those situations which are increasing in number. So to the question on cost, anybody else want to it's in, simply because you asked about, about the Metropolitan Police Department and the city. The city police department is about a third of the city's general fund budget and never once in the, have the mayor and I had a conversation about the economics of it. It costs what it costs to provide public safety and this adds to public safety so it's an investment that we have to make. Good. We'll take uh, another question or two and then we'll be done. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, certainly from the Commission's perspective, we don't see them as, as, as either or. You, you should do both. Uh, and much of the work of our child well-being and education uh, and equality working group, economic opportunity and an equity working group is geared toward the question of investments in the community at, at, the, at the level of young people as well as at the level of jobs and, and job training. But don't you think that if you invest more in the community itself as far as the youth is concerned, because you know you hear a lot of people asking, why don't you have more things for young people yeah. to do? So you want to worry about violence and uproar that we've been experiencing as far as places being burned down or wherever, or having sure. jobs, not only during the summer, but as a whole. Why not invest some of that time and energy into the youth themselves? Yeah, we're definitely going to be making uh, recommendations on those investments we're looking at. Uh, some of the best models. So in this particular work group, they were looking at models on police training um, for the sake of public safety, and this is one of those models they're putting forward. We expect that those working groups that are working, specifically the one around child well-being, will also invite the community to say, these are the kind of investments we need to be making. And I wouldn't be surprised if you heard things very specifically about uh, out-of-school time supports, uh, wraparound services, some of the tactical um, priorities that have already come out of that working group are al aligned with some of the things that you're saying. Uh, but there are kind of two tracks that we're working on. There are the underlying social issues, and there are the immediate issues. And if we want to, want to talk about caring for our young people, we recognize that there would be no Ferguson Commission unless there was a unique interaction uh, between an 18-year-old uh, and a police officer. So in as much as we talk about investing in those young people, we also have to talk about the behaviors and preparation of officers to engage those young people. So use of force training uh, and exercising and practicing the muscles for what you do when you come into contact with a young person that may be different um, than you are, may have a different cultural understanding than you are. So use of force and cultural competency training that we're talking about mandating uh, in the post commission have great impact on those young people as well. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Asher Benaria. He's a, a world-renowned scholar on child well-being uh, out of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He happened to have presented at a child well-being symposium at the Fed in, here in November of 2014. He said when you ask children, when you ask young people about their well-being, uh, some of the first indicators they come up with there are three. Number one, uh, what is their belief and understanding of safety in their neighborhood? Number two, what is their conception of the local police? Number three, how many times have, do they see people uh, engaged in violence or hitting at school? So when we talk about policing in the community and we talk about public safety, we're talking about young people and their well-being. So this training will be just as critical and important 
uh, to the well-being of young people, particularly those of older age uh, in our community, as, it, as will be the recommendations out of our child well-being working group. So we're going to do that work. We're doing that work. Uh, but we've got to do this work as well. I would uh, note that we've been joined by representatives of uh, the Vanita Park and Northwoods uh, Police Departments. So we're going to wrap up here. Uh, thank you for being here. I want to thank the Citizen Law Enforcement Working Group for their hard work on this and for those that are here. Uh, Barb and Amy from the Police Wives Association and others that are behind us will certainly be available for questions afterwards. So thank you all for being here.